I can't say with complete confidence that, you know, AI is <laughs> going to come up against a really hard wall unless they really listen to us neuroscientists. I can't, I can't make yeah. that kind of statement. I think, you know, intellectually, I think it's going to be exciting even for them if they keep kind of learning about the brain. But whether it's going to be absolutely necessary for what they are trying to achieve, I don't know. Maybe not. I think it's very much a wild west where everybody is riding around with their favorite theories and, you know, the things that they think are the most important things, myself included, to work on and, and understand that there is very, very little uh, consensus still. This is Brain Inspired. Welcome, everyone. This is Paul Middlebrooks, or at least in all probability, it's Paul Middlebrooks. I mean, given that you've heard my voice before, you're probably not too uncertain. But if I talk like this, you may be more uncertain. You may learn that most likely it is me, just using a voice that I could use, but you're glad that I don't. Anyway, how does your brain represent? a model of things that you perceive and learn, and the uncertainty about those things. This is one of the questions that Mate Lingyal asks himself every few minutes or so. Mate is a computational neuroscientist at the University of Cambridge, and he's a senior research fellow with the Central European University, interested in that and other related questions, and he is my guest today. Uh, he invented the famous McCulloch Pitts model of a neuron. Well, you'll hear more about that in a minute anyway. Uh, during the show, we discuss things like what is a probabilistic internal model? How might our brains represent probability distributions, which are useful for implementing Bayes' rule and why Bayes' rule is important to implement? Uh, what makes a theory worth pursuing experimentally? the difference between the deep learning version of machine learning, as we normally think of it, and the probabilistic model approach to machine learning, which is Mate's domain. Uh, we talk about famous Hungarians and a lot more. Mate is delivering a keynote address at the Cognitive Computational Neuroscience Conference, so we talk about that a bit. It looks awesome. Um, I hope you're going. You can find links to the conference and everything that we discussed today at uh, braininspired.co. Okay, here, in all likelihood, is Mate Lingyo. Mate, let me, hang on, let me just pull up my prior here. Yeah, it's looking good. It's looking like my prior suggests that this is going to be a good conversation and we're both going to enjoy ourselves. I'm going to collect evidence while we talk and then I'll have to check my posterior when we're done here and, and see if we're still good. Uh, has sure, anyone, go anyone ahead. ever used that joke introducing you? No. <laughs> Partly because I haven't given too many interviews, but or I have, yeah, but uh, no. Oh, thank God. I was hoping that I would be original in that, in that sense. Mate, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for being here. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. So you are a part of the uh, Computational and Biological Learning Lab at the University of Cambridge. and and that larger group has subgroups uh, within it, um, which fall into either sort of the biological learning side or the machine learning side. Uh, and, and you head up the computational learning and memory group of, of those subgroups. Now, I could use a lot of words to describe what you do, but you would be better at it. So in a nutshell, how would you describe what you do? I'm a computational neuroscientist or a theoretical neuroscientist, which means I'm using mathematical models to understand the brain. So I don't do experiments myself. I build theories um, that are kind of put in a, into a mathematical form, and I collaborate with experimental neuroscientists to test those theories. You know, in the experimental world, a lot of people, so I worked with uh, non-human primates, with monkeys, and you'd often hear about monkey envy, right, with people who worked with sort of like, um, other mammals or other animal models and stuff. And I feel like uh, it may be just my personal uh, outlook, but I, I have theorist envy, I think, uh, coming from the experimental <laughs> world. Like, you know, 
<laughs> yeah, I think there's a lot of mutual envy uh, in both directions. Um, and, uh, you know, there are people who go from one side to another. I've always stuck to uh, theory, I guess, because I know that I would be really crap at doing experiments and I really enjoy doing theory. Uh, but, yeah. So your your first love, if I understand correctly, is mathematics. And, and, I mean, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but you decided not to go into pure math. And instead, you decided to invent uh, the field of mathematical models of the brain. Is that right? I'm impressed by the amount of background check you've done. It's my uh, job. It's my job, <laughs> man. <laughs> that's really impressive. Yeah, yeah that's, that's indeed true. So I, I went, I mean, when I went to high school, I went to a high school that had a special kind of mathematics curriculum in Budapest. And Hungary has a kind of a traditionally strong kind of educational system in mathematics. And this was one of the top schools for that. So I did a lot of math uh, between the age of 14 and 18. And so by the end of it, it was clear to me that I could do it, but I was not going to become a mathematician. But I also discovered that I really enjoyed kind of trying to construct mathematical models for how different things in the in the world worked. And in particular, I got fascinated by how the brain worked. So I figured that uh, the most exciting thing I could do would be to build mathematical models of the brain, even though I wasn't aware of the time that such a field already existed. <laughs> this this is a case of par- parallel evolution, essentially. Uh, it is. So yeah, I mean, I, I reinvented the McCullough and Pitts model, which is like the most wow. kind of... But- first mathematical models uh, of, of how neurons might work. Um, it was, yeah, I, I just ran some code to simulate, you know, something that I thought would be a reasonable model of a neural network. And you know, later, years later, I learned that that was actually the Michael Pitts model. But um, yeah, so with all the arrogance of an 18-year-old, <laughs> I at that point when I was finishing high school, I decided that, fine, I knew everything that there was to know about math. So it was time to learn about the brain if I wanted to do this. Uh, so I went to biology, um, to do biology at university, which is a huge mistake because, you know, a huge amount of biology has nothing to do with the brain. And I was really not interested in a lot of that. And plus the kind of the, the way they, at least at the time they were training biologists, in Hungary, where I was still doing my uh, undergraduate, was very unlike the way I preferred kind of learning about stuff, which was much more um, kind of, of a mathematician's way of mm. of learning about things, like understanding rather than rote learning, and you know, yeah, and deriving things from principles rather than just accepting facts. Yeah. So that wasn't an ideal fit for me, but I, in the end, I just stuck with it and <laughs> got on with it through until through the end, essentially. Oh wow! Congratulations, I guess. At least you didn't go in the medical field, you know. So. Uh, no, no, I I could have made the worst mistake. That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but so there was never there was never a doubt in my mind that I would be do uh, that I would be working on mathematical models. So I never I, it never occurred to me that I would be doing experiments, even though I was in this biology. Yeah. So. 300 eye rolls later, you finally got through it and uh, you exactly. continued. Exactly. Precisely. Yeah. So, so Hungary has, um, I mean, you're Hungarian, right? That's right. Yeah. So yep. Hungary has this like sort of long um, celebrated uh, lineage, right, of, of mathematicians and, and quantitatively minded people. Is John von Neumann like the, the most well-known, do you think, the, the most celebrated uh, of the, in that line? Uh, I mean... It would be hard to pick one. Yeah. I guess, you know, there are a few really well-known ones. I mean, there, you know, there's the person after whom the the Mathematics Institute of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences is named, Rényi, okay. uh, who was, uh, yeah, uh, a famous mathematician. Um, and then, you know, ever since, you know, even the current President of the Hungarian Academy of Scientists is a is a very famous mathematician, Lovas. Uh, before that, there was of course Paul Erdős, of Erdős number fame. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and and the list really goes on. So there's yeah there's been a there's been a strong tradition of, of mathematicians, but certainly von Neumann is is certainly one of the the most famous ones and probably probably the best known internationally. I would say yeah, very well deservedly, obviously. I'm American, and as you know. As an American, I'm completely ignorant of the rest of the world. So, uh, yeah, unfortunately, <laughs> but but is it a is it a point of pride uh, in in Hungary to uh, to go down that line? Or I don't know. I mean, it's hard to generalize about uh, yeah. about Hungarians, and there are 
odd bunch, they can be proud of a lot of things, uh, which uh, <laughs> which I would personally not be very proud of uh, sometimes. <laughs> Now you have to name one. Name one of those things. Uh, yeah. let, let, okay, okay. I, I'm going to. I'm going to okay, pass take a on hard that. pass. But the, okay. uh, exactly. But the. But yeah, I mean, the Hungarians like to pride themselves in general. Uh, I don't know how much the general population knows about the unique status of mass, but in general, they like to pride themselves as having a lot of really smart scientists. They tend to forget the fact that they drove a lot of those people outside, you know, out of the country, uh, and they are doing it as we speak right now. As well um mm. so um this is not just a, a principle of uh nothing earned easy is worth knowing or or you know that whatever that principle is no, right? no, yeah. no it's 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 much more grim than that yeah so uh so i guess yeah so mate we're, we're gonna uh be talking about multiple things here today one of the things we're gonna be talking about is um the cognitive computational neuroscience conference where you're going to be giving a keynote uh, address in just a couple months here. So just in conferences in general, so people talk about their, you know, scientific moments that they've had. Uh, is there like a moment um, from a conference that you can remember that you could, uh, that sort of has influenced you in a, in a rather deep way that, that you can remember? Yeah, I mean, there's always, almost always moments at conferences that that I um, that I feel that, you know, this is the reason why I'm in the field, to have these kind of aha moments. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the last one, actually, Nathaniel Daw is going to be another keynote speaker. I think he his episode will have aired just before yours. So. Uh, great, fantastic. So, you know, this this just happens to be one of the last examples of this yeah. one. That's why I'm going to give you this. But he spoke at a workshop uh, at the last computational and systems neuroscience conference in Lisbon this year. And uh, he was discussing his way of trying to interpret some rather kind of um, uh, interesting but somewhat confusing data from uh, a colleague's lab about how dopamine might or might not represent uh, prediction errors which would be the kind of the classical theoretical account. And the actually the this colleague of him, Ileana Witten from Princeton, uh, uh, presented some of these results at the main meeting. And I, you know, while I was listening to her talk, I had this thought that, you know, maybe this is not all that much in conflict with what we think, uh. with what we know about prediction errors. And then at, later at the workshop, Nathaniel gave this talk about how he's kind of analyzing and looking at Ilana's data. And he exactly did the things that, you know, that were in a very vague way kind of uh, – in in my mind and it just caused this aha moment that oh yeah this is this is the way to think about it and you know it's not it's probably not going to change the world uh, although i think it's it's really cool both the experimental results and nathaniel's way of thinking about it um so i don't know uh how much is going to change the world uh maybe it will maybe it won't uh maybe it's it's a small step uh for mankind but it was definitely a big step for me <laughs> just in terms of bringing that uh moment and that's that's really what i most enjoy in science in general either through my own research or through someone else's research i don't really mind <laughs> and i don't really care as long as it as it as it brings me that aha moment that's that's what i'm in for here Oh man, that's awesome! I actually just got goosebumps a little bit. It's seriously on my arms just uh, thinking about it. You know, because I'm out of it. I haven't had that in a while. I have to live vicariously through you guys now. So, <laughs> and, and that's interesting uh, that it was Nathaniel Daw because you know I I spoke with him, and of course he's not Hungarian, and so he's not that intelligent. But we managed to get through the uh, <laughs> the interview somehow. <laughs> so, so you work on a lot of things. You also collaborate with people like Daniel Wolpert. Um, you've worked on active sensing, which is making movements to gather uh, sensory information to perform some behavior better. Um, and I understand you'll be talking uh, at CCN about probabilistic internal models during your keynote. And, and we will dive into more detail later, but really broadly, what are probabilistic internal models and, and what aspects of them will you be talking about? Internal models are these representations that we use to summarize essentially our knowledge of how the brain, of, sorry, of how the world works. And then we can use these internal models to, to make predictions and therefore kind of adapt our choices, our movements, 
uh, and our decisions better. So we can use these internal models to, for example, to to simulate what's going to happen depending on our actions, uh, or we can use these internal models to uh, make inferences about quantities that we can't directly observe, mm. but which would be relevant for us to make decisions. So that's that's what internal models are. And then the qualifier probabilistic means that the mathematical language that we use to describe the operation of these internal models is that of probability theory, uh, because the so-called normative argument is that that is the way it should be, that the best way to use a model of the ver- world to, to perform inferences is to acknowledge that you can never be sure about your inferences and therefore to represent your uncertainty about those inferences. And then the correct calculus to compute with uncertainties is given by the laws of probability. And indeed, there is evidence that our brains, including animal, other animals, do take into account uh, all sorts of uncertainties that we have and at least approximately uh, apply the rules of probability. I live in the United States, and I just realized that our president probably does not uh, use these probability distributions, uh, any uncertainty in any communication. I'm sure, I'm sure he does. If not at other times, then you know, when he is reaching to grasp a, uh, a glass of water or maybe more like a can of Coke, um, he, he, <laughs> he, he does uh, unknowingly. So we are doing this most of the time without even being aware of this. Yeah. Or when he, you know, or or when he, you know, his visual system interprets the world. Uh, that's also happening now. Whether in kind of conscious decision making he is doing this or not, that's that's an all different matter. Yeah, let's not <laughs> and, go down uh, that road. There's a lot of interesting literature, by the way. There's a lot of interesting literature on the pathologies of of decision making and the pathologies of you know and how they might be related to uh, kind of uh, pathology of these kind of probabilistic internal models. So you know, that, that might say something about your president. Uh, we'll, we'll leave it at that for now then. <laughs> okay. What, what do you think? Um, so, so, you know, within this realm um, of internal op- probabilistic internal model, models, what is the most uh, critical or intriguing question to you right now? I guess in some sense, the million dollar question there is how does the brain do it? And, you know, what, how can we, how can we trace it down to the you know the actual recordable and observable behavior of neurons and neural circuits and put our fingers onto it and say that ah so this is how yeah. it's happening in the brain this is how probability distributions at least approximately get kind of represented and manipulated in just the right way uh, in the brain is it approximate is a keyword there you think yes it is a keyword yes absolutely I mean, there is no. I don't think anybody in their right mind would claim that the brain does exact probabilistic inference, just because it's so, it's so widely intractable that uh, that's that's really a non-starter. So the real the question is, what kind of approximation the brain uses to to do this, and how can we identify that in neural responses? This is it's an interesting question for AI. Hopefully, we'll get to later, um, and just doing doing this sort of thing in machines, but. So you're a theorist. So far, I don't know how many times I've asked this, but um, it's a hundred percent rate uh, of a certain answer to this question I'm about to ask you, and I'm I'm imagining you're going to answer the same. So I'm wondering what you think that we need more of right now to to get to this. Do we need more theory, or better theory, or more data, more experiments, more better models, something else? Okay, so now you made me nervous that maybe I'll be the only one who, who no, doesn't I would know love the right it. answer. Uh, okay. I think we need both. Uh, <laughs> That's not the. Yeah, sure. We need we need more and better of everything. That's true. Yeah, yeah. Um, so right, I, I think I think there has been incredible progress on the experimental end of things that we are starting to be able to record mm. from an incredible number of neurons simultaneously with incredible precision. Well, that's, that's on like, that's on the technology end of things. It's not yeah, necessarily yeah. the experimental side, I suppose. Yeah. Okay, fine. If that's what you mean. Okay. Well, but so I think we, I think there hasn't been necessarily so many kind of unequivocal breakthroughs at the theory end. And in particular, we need just a better integration of the two yeah. to really kind of make theories that produce testable predictions and then do the experiments that test those predictions uh, 
you know, about things that we really care about. I may just be talking from the silo of my own show here uh, because I, I talk to a lot of theorists um, and that might just be a product of, you know, the people I'm talking to. But it seems like there are so many theories right now. Um, and I'm wondering if we've swung actually too far in the theory direction. So, like, I, I, for instance, I don't want to spend weeks trying to understand someone's theory that ultimately will be a dead end. Right. And so, like, what what is your criteria, for instance, for deciding whether a theory has merit to then design an experiment to really test, right? Like what, what keeps you reading a paper about someone's theory, for instance? So there's very different kinds of theories, um, right? So in general, I keep reading on a paper if I feel that they are solving, that they are solving a problem that I think is relevant and that I can't think of the solution of, you know, off the top of my head that, you know, that I feel like, oh yeah, it's, it's a relevant and, and the challenging question. Mm -hmm. And so, and then, you know, if it's a slightly different question, but you know, if I want to convince other people that, for example, my theory, that they should be interested in my theory, then, then I also want to show that there is some experimental data that it really makes contact with and at least kind of preliminary, even if the, you know, the ideal data set doesn't exist yet, that you can kind of do preliminary checks of the theory with existing data sets and it passes uh, those checks. So just very pragmatically, the way I collaborate with, with experimentalists is very often that kind of I start from a very kind of theoretical standpoint. I identify a question which I think is relevant and interesting. I develop a theory about it and then I start making predictions. But before I ask my colleagues to do experiments for me, I do the best I can to show that existing data, that the theory kind of makes contact with and is confirmed by existing data sets. And only once I pass that hurdle, uh -huh. I feel like I, sh you know, I should be in the position of you know, asking for new experiments, for example. So do you approach problems then through, what lens do you approach problems through? Is it sort of just this really computational lens or like a normative lens starting with you see a behavior and you think about a normative issue or or an evolutionary etc yeah i don't i don't really think about evolution uh, explicitly although yeah. i guess in some sense all normative theories maybe implicitly kind of make reference to evolution but the um but yeah i mean most in most of my work i i kind of build normative theories so i identify a computational problem that the brain needs to solve and which i think is challenging and then I kind of try to derive at least approximately optimal solutions to that problem. And then I try to show that the way different bits of the brain work is very kind of analogous to those approximately optimal solutions. And sometimes it's at the level of single neurons or synapses, and sometimes it's at the level of behavior. So mm. these kind of problems, you know, sometimes these problems are, you know, how to pass information around in a reliable way in neural networks when the neurons have to communicate uh, uh, by spikes, which is kind of an, inf which creates an information bottleneck between them. So that's kind of, that's a kind of a, a computational challenge that needs to be solved at kind of a, at the single cell or single synapse level. And then, but then there is questions of, you know, how do you gather information from the environment, which, which you were referring to, uh, where you really want to look at behavior. Mm. And then, of course, the you know, in the ideal case, we can connect these different levels eventually. I don't really know how much crosstalk uh, there is, like within your larger group at the University of Cambridge. There, but, but like I said at the beginning, you guys are kind of broadly divided into machine learning and biological learning sides. How, in your mind and and in your experience, how can fields like cognitive science and neuroscience, computational neuroscience? And the machine learning side, the artificial intelligence side, sort of on the purer machine learning, artificial intelligence side. How how can these fields work best together? Yeah, I mean, I very much grew up in this. Uh, you know, when I did my postdoc, that was in the Gatsby Computational Neuroscience Unit, which was kind of uh, one of the pioneers, if not the pioneering place for combining machine learning and computational neuroscience and uh, you know part of the reason why I came here to Cambridge because there was a group being formed here at the time uh, that had the same premise that we want to combine these it's a great group it looks like a great group by the way 
and it's a fantastic and it's been a fantastic group uh, absolutely and so so there is different ways of combining strengths you can actually have collaborative projects and we have had examples of that when you know when uh, you know people from the machine learning side of CBL and uh, some people uh, some you know some of us from the more biological learning and of CBL collaborated on a specific project but also just the way we organize life at CBL, which is not coincidentally very much like we, you know, life was organized at the Gatsby. Several of us were at the Gatsby at some point, uh. so that we have joint meetings several times uh, a week uh, when we mix people and we have talks when these talks need to speak to all of CBL, both about our own research and and about kind of. Anything, you know, there are talks when we talk about our, our own research and there are so-called tea talks when we talk about something that we found kind of scientifically interesting, but not that very directly related to our uh, own research. And all of these need to be uh, delivered in a way that they're accessible to to the whole of CBL. Um, like a common language or? Yeah. So there is a common language and there is a common appreciation. I think that's that's what's really important, and that you know the the faculty members of CBL are really we're really talking to each other and 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 really have a lot of appreciation for for each other's work. I think that's that's what's important to kind of keep exposing our groups to to both sides of things. So I think the best the best way for these fields at large to collaborate is to is to train people who really know about both these fields and and really care about both. I think that's the best investment we can make. It's a lot to learn as a just a learner. Yes. But learning is fun. Yes, it is. But it takes time. Hey, take a few deep breaths now. Jorge Chang, hot damn I'm grateful for your benevolence in supporting the show through Patreon. Find out how to do that for chump change if you find the show valuable. Go to braininspired.co to do that. I do have projects in the works that supporters of the show will have early and either free or super cheap access to when they're ready. Okay, back to the show. Let's, uh, let's go deeper into your work on probabilistic internal models. So you have published a sort of a series of papers in which this work builds. And I'm not actually sure which is the best place to point people just to dip their toe in. If it's specifically about our own work, then somewhat paradoxically, maybe the best place to start is a review paper that we wrote back in 2010. Oh, okay. Okay. Which actually preceded so we, we ended up writing papers in the wrong order. So we first <laughs> wrote the review paper for the things that we published years later. That is awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So we published. Uh, so really, we should have done it in the, uh, <laughs> uh, in the opposite order. But we first published the review paper back in 2010. It was a text paper with me as the last author. And then, and then we kind of started publishing the, the, the actual result papers. So maybe yeah. even today, in some sense, you know, so the 2010 paper in many ways precedes the work that we have done since. Maybe they could read the 2010 paper and then just jump into the archive, uh, your recent papers, like your paper in archive, for instance, and then and then jump around. Who knows? I guess you don't do things in order, so it doesn't really matter. Maybe. <laughs> so. Yeah. Okay, so you work on these uh, probabilistic machine learning or, or AI algorithms, and you contrast that uh, with sort of vanilla deep learning algorithms these days. And I know that these two types of AI systems or models are not mutually exclusive per se, but they there are still differences in them and, and that you favor this probabilistic machine learning side. I'm wondering if you could just say a few words about the differences between what we think of when we think of deep nets and uh, the probabilistic machine learning uh, approach, uh, maybe with some examples of, of uh, how one one would be better than the other, for instance, in certain situations. Yeah, I mean, the the main difference is that the the focus in kind of in the probabilistic modeling field is on defining these internal models and then internal models that we think the brain might be in the business of kind of implementing hmm. and how uncertainty is represented 
you know, in these internal models with regard to quantities of interest. Whereas deep learning is really kind of a bunch of algorithms that work spectacularly. And there is not necessarily much thought given to, first of all, how uncertainty is represented. And indeed, uh, some of these systems uh, can fail uh, just as they can succeed very spectacularly. They can also fail under some circumstances spectacularly. Uh, and in, in fact, they can, they can fail with high confidence. Hmm. Well, so j just to be concrete, like most deep learning nets, uh, the way that uncertainty is represented is just in the last layer as in like a, right. the probability that a certain category is the right answer, yes. right? Yeah. So it, yeah. So so that's classical in the way you train these uh, these uh, these networks. That's right. And and so uh, and so uh, what I was referring to concretely is that you can you can engineer particular inputs to these networks uh, on which they they will fail. They will widely misclassify. Uh, those inputs, and moreover, they will misclassify them with very high confidence. Yeah. So they are not even aware that there's something odd going on there. Um, <laughs> so th the emphasis there is on is on algorithms, whereas the the uh, the emphasis in the probabilistic world is more on models. So really, kind of in Mars terms, if I can use these terms here. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. We talk about Mars plenty on the show. Uh, so a lot of the probabilistic kind of modeling work is at at the computational level and you know deep networks are very much on the algorithmic level and right. you know a big open question there i think is you know what's the actual computation and and also just pragmatic just practically they are really good at kind of supervised learning and and in the case when there is lots of data around we don't know yet how to make them really work well when the data when data is less, when you are doing supervised learning and so forth. So there's uh, various classically probabilistic methods uh, have been quite good in kind of doing unsupervised learning and, uh, you know, in conditions when there's not a lot of data. A more real world kind of condition. Well, in, in many ways, it is a, uh, it is a more real, uh, real world condition, yes. Uh, so I think there is... There is strengths in both, and in in fact, you know, I I'd like to think about you know a lot of what's happening in deep learning as essentially developing approximate inference algorithms for kind of probabilistic internal models, if you like. Um, so I think that, that that can potentially be a really rich uh, area of investigation, kind of trying to kind of work out these relationships, and uh, because you know at the end of, at the end of the day, the brain is a big huge big deep network neural network with a lot of recurrency so there's no no question that uh, in as much as the brain is in the business of computing with probably thinking the models it is actually using neural networks to do that um, so i think it's a completely legitimate question uh, to ask how you know how can we use the neural networks to to implement some of the computations that one needs to do with probabilistic internal models and how, how can we interpret already existing neural networks as essentially doing that Superficially, one of the attractive things about uh, deep neural networks is that these units are inspired by neurons, right? And and so it looks brain-like because these units are connected and have whatever synaptic strengths, weights uh, between them. And, um, and and that's not something that um, probabilistic internal models really has going for it at the, super, at the superficial level. So it's an attractive thing to look at the diagram of a deep net, right, and think, oh, it looks like a brain. So from your vantage point, is that a, um, you know, is that a hurdle to get over? Like, oh, it's, you know, that, uh, okay, it looks like a brain. Of course, these units aren't anything like neurons. I mean, they are in the very, very limiting cases, right? So then you kind of have this hurdle to get over from, to convince people, right, that maybe the probabilistic internal machine learning models are are, are the way to go. But why would they be the way to go when we have neurons right here and it looks like the brain? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, and and uh, I mean, look, a lot of the kind of the probabilistic modeling uh, literature didn't even try to address what what's happening at the level of neurons, because as I said, it's uh, a lot of it was is more about computation and behavior correspondingly. So you know, they didn't didn't need to worry about it. And indeed, when you want to know how those probabilistic computations are implemented in the brain that's as far as i'm concerned one big open question and i think there's a lot to learn from the recent successes of deep neural networks they can do amazing stuff so maybe they can even <laughs> they yeah. can even implement probabilistic internal models we just need to figure out how they do that um so i don't i mean look if you want to talk about neurons then then you need to get serious so in in, in that case i mean some of the some of the things we have started doing 
I'm I'm very careful. My research, my approach to to this is I, I'm usually quite. I usually at least try to be quite careful and kind of address questions at the level of detail which is absolutely necessary. Mm. So um, if we are interested in how you know probably the distributions are represented in neural activities, that might be an interesting question uh, on its own right. And and for that uh, you need to make predictions about about just that neural responses how neural how you expect neural responses to vary uh, under different conditions with different stimuli with different expectations and so forth and so on but for that you don't need to def- necessarily think about circuit mechanisms like what, what's actually happening how should inter- individual neurons integrate their inputs you really just want to make predictions at that point about you know the pheno- phenomenological behavior of neurons but not the circuit mechanisms that bring about that right yeah but then if you want to think about circuit mechanisms right and and just to make the analogy clear kind of the the way people for example use deep neural networks is that all of this happens at at once they have a circuit mechanism so so to speak right they have just as you said they have you know neurons that have synapses in them and and all that and then they also have neural responses that they can relate to what's happening in the brain right that they have you know they can show that look i get receptive fields that look like the ones in the ventral visual stream and so forth and so on yeah um so my approach is much in some sense is is much more kind of uh, cautious and piecemeal, if you like. Uh, so I, I first want to establish that, you know, we are looking at, we are thinking about the l- right representations. And once we have those representations, um, then start thinking about, you know, the actual neural circuit mechanisms. But I guess that's when I, that's when my biologist of bringing kind of comes out and say that, okay, but if you really want to think about circuit mechanisms, let's get serious about it. Then mm. I start caring about things that a lot of the deep uh, network uh, stuff doesn't care about, like separation between excitatory and inhibitor cells, like yeah. recurrent connections, like neurons not having saturating firing rates in the physiological regime, and a lot of this stuff. Uh, so at that point, I, I get more serious, I guess. Um, but I don't only ever get there if I kind of cleared some of the hurdles that come before that, at least for me. So you're saying when you, you're equating seriousness with mechanistic level, I suppose, <laughs> at the implementation <laughs> level. No, I think you need to be serious about, you know, you need to decide what it is that you are making a prediction about, and then you need to get serious about that. So if you want to, if you want to make, uh, you know, predictions and claims about neural representations, then you don't necessarily need to make claims about neural circuit mechanisms, and that's fine. And then get serious about that. Get serious about testing predictions about that, you know, try to test those predictions under as wide conditions as possible and so forth and so on. Yeah. But if you really if you really want to say something about circuit mechanisms, then be serious about that. And don't just say that, you know, I'll have some 10 age and, you know, I'll I'll rely on my neurons being, you know, having saturated fighting rates half of the time because that's that's not how the cortex works, really. Come on. I mean <laughs> that's not how the cortex works. Come on. <laughs> So you actually covered a lot of ground there, um, and I have questions related to a, a lot of that stuff. Um, one of the critical questions that you've asked is how are probability distri- distributions encoded in the responses of neural populations? So, uh, you know, at the risk of, of repeating yourself, why probability is- distributions? And, uh, you know, maybe you can say a few words about what's important um, to know about the probability approach if we're going to get into a little bit more of the details here. Yeah, so so you want to have at least a crude representation of uncertainty about pretty much anything that you compute fundamentally because you always have to fuse information between different sources, uh, either from different sensory modalities or between previous experiences laid down in memory and your current input or different processing streams in general all the time we, we need to fuse information from different sources. And the best way to fuse information from different sources, if you fuse them in a way uh, that you know your associated uncertainty about each of your inputs so that your output takes into account each of your inputs to a degree that is commensurate with the associated uncertainties. So that's that's kind of that's kind of the starting point. Mm. Uh, that's That's a very generic kind of law, if you like, of information processing systems, that if you are fusing information from 
uh, different sources, you better know the associated uncertainties if you if you want to fuse them, uh, you know, optimally. And that's a really very generic argument that can be kind of that can be applied to many different situations that are relevant for the brain. And that, that's mathematically pure. That, and that's pure. Yeah. And at, at the level of behavior, at the level of single neurons, uh, really, kind of quite widely. And so if that's if that's the case, then and we believe that the brain is somehow trying to achieve that at least approximately, then the question is, okay, so how does the brain, whenever it computes something, how how does the brain represent the uncertainty associated with that thing that it has just computed? And so that's that's what a lot of my uh, research is about, is trying to account that. So so why is Bayes' theorem so important to consider? You know, why is it such a strong candidate? or so attractive to, uh, as a basis for brain computations? Uh, well, because it's one of the two laws of probability theory. And <laughs> and so there aren't many more out there. Um, you know, when I, use, when I teach, I usually say this, that there is really only two laws in, in probability theory, um, the law of summation and the, uh, and the law of multiplication. Which together form Bayes. But yeah, I mean, Bayes' rule in some sense uses both, but really it's, it's mostly has, it has to do with the law of multiplication, that you know, the, probability, the joint probability of two events is the probability of one event times the probability of the other event given this first event. And, and that when you rearrange that, you get essentially Bayes' rule. Um, so that's, that's just that. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's, that's why Bayes', Bayes rule, uh, another way of putting it is that, is that Bayes' rule allows a system to do the most amazing thing, which is, uh, which is by the way, I think how statistics should be taught in general. Statistics is, is usually taught as like the most boring subject with a <laughs> big book of recipes about how to do t-tests and whatnot. But really statistics, and within that, in particular, Bayes' rule allows us to reason about things that we can't observe based, uh, based on things that we can observe. And that's amazing, right? You make some observations, and then based on those observations, you have a principled, rigorous mathematical way to reason about things that you can never observe. I mean, that's just that's just the most it's amazing thing one, one can do. It's beautiful, and it, and it makes it sense, a lot of sense to me mathematically. The way that you just stated that is uh, really can land home very easily. I consider myself to have a pretty strong mathematical background, not, you know, super high level. You know, I took differential equations and oh, something beyond that. I can't remember now, but that was a while ago. But, <laughs> you know, uh, talking with, um, I had Federico uh, Turkheimer on the show and he he made the point that um, his students, he doesn't think that Bayes happens in the brain essentially, and this is really watered down, um, because people have such a hard time even understanding Bayes' rule. And yeah. You know, internally, I sort of yeah. chuckled because, yeah, like it's sort of like um, every time I approach Bayes' rule, I have I have to reset myself, look at the uh, equations, think about what the likelihood means, think about what the different you know given x or x given y, and and I have to reorient myself every time. And even then, it's like a fleeting understanding. Why is it so hard for us to understand Bayes' rule? Uh, I so I think there's two questions in there. So first of all, yeah, I mean, I fully appreciate. I, it's hard for me to to say why is it so hard. It reminds me when people ask me whether Hungarian is a difficult language, uh, and my answer to that is not not to me. Uh, to me, you know, when I discovered Bayes, you know, Bayes rule for myself uh, and the whole idea of of Bayesian inference, it it was actually one of perhaps one of the biggest aha moments that that it just felt so natural and it felt like. Yeah, of course, this is how, this is the right way to, to think about these mathematical problems. So to me, it's very natural. And, yeah. and, and to a lot of people, it's very natural. And, and, uh, but, but I also know and, and very much appreciate that to a lot of people, it's not at all natural at all. Uh, and I think, you know, it's, it's just, you know, practice, I guess, make perfect. <laughs> uh, you know, if, if yeah. you work through a, a couple of, uh, examples that, that helps. Um, uh, but, uh, kind of, uh, the, I guess the bigger scientific question is that so if it's so hard for us, there's no way that's happening in the brain. But that, I, I've always found that an odd argument, right? We can we can throw, you know, uh, people have you know people have been able to throw objects at each other and at animals uh, with incredible precision for millennia before you know Newton discovered uh, <laughs> you know, the laws of mechanics. Um, so uh, yeah. so just because we can't like. 
consciously access these rules and compute with them with pen and paper, that doesn't mean that our brains aren't doing it um, in some way, right? Sure. Uh, our brains have obviously been very well adapted to the basic laws of mechanics, uh, and we can, you know, uh, we can make very good use of that. Some, uh, some better than others, yeah. Uh, some better than others, yeah. sure. Uh, <laughs> but still, um, so yeah. So I don't think I, I don't feel that is a particularly strong argument against. No, it. no, I'm not arguing that at all. I just I thought it was an interesting but, but, take. But, but but also look, I mean, there is there, as we know, there is a very there is a very strong and 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 very fruitful tradition in psychology and economics that shows how you know all the fallacies. And, and wrongdoings that, that we commit when we try to manipulate probabilities in our hands. Uh-huh. And some Nobel Prizes have been <laughs> awarded for that. Yeah, we're terrible at it. Quite rightly so. But again, you know, a, a lot of the times um, it, it is the case that, that we can, you know, our brain can do stuff that we can't do, uh, you know, this, this somewhat kind of loosely stating it. That, you know, when you sit down and think about it, you can't do something that, you know, when the same question is posed to you in the right, in the ecologically appropriate way, you can do it without thinking. Yeah. Right. So, you know, um, most of us, including myself, uh, you know, can't can't solve, um, you know, optimal control problems. <laughs> uh, our brain, our brains can, you know, solve them with quite amazing efficiency. A lot of the times, you know, when we are reaching for a glass of water, here it is. Yeah. Just as I was referring to this, uh, you know, with respect to uh, your president. So yeah, I mean, so our brains can solve all these kind of things that you know, when we need to think about them, uh, then we find really difficult. But that I think is a is a very different question. Sorry for that aside there, but I appreciate you going down that road with me for a second. So, <laughs> you know, back to the brain, I suppose, um, and and the probability approach. So these probability distributions give rise to a lot of noise, essentially, um, and which is a um, part of our brain response. Brain activity is noise. So is this neural variability or noise, if you will, is it a feature of the brain or is it a bug? You know, does it serve a function? Yeah. So first of all, just because a system computes with with probability distributions, that doesn't mean that the system must be noisy, right? Our computer, you know, we can we can compute with probability distributions on our computers that, you know, to a large extent, for all intents and purposes, are noiseless. Um, uh, and when you compute, when you solve a mathematical problem with pen and paper with probability distributions, you know, you write down equations, uh, kind of symbols with, without noise being there. So uh, just because you're computing, uh, performing probabilistic computations, that doesn't necessarily imply that you need to be noisy. And in fact, uh, there have been a number of proposals for how the brain uh, might represent uh, probability distributions that do not uh, require that, you know, that the brain be variable. So whether variability is really noise, so uh, or that is nuisance, or or whether it's actually useful, or so it's a bug or a feature. I guess that's how you phrased it. Um, you know, I think for most of the time it's a bug, and you know, if I I have to make an evolutionary argument, my argument would be that uh, probably originally it's it's noise, but then as it so happens so often in in evolution, you know, um, we try to make the best use of stuff that we are given. So the way I see it and the kind of theories that my group develops uh, is that um, they actually make good use of this variability for representing probability distributions. Mm. Um, And the way I personally think about it is that, you know, noise was probably already there and that the brain somehow learned to make good use of that, uh, of that variability in order to represent uh, uncertainty. But that's just one, one proposal out there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you use like a, a sampling approach to test this. Do you, do you want to just speak a little bit about how perceptual uncertainty is related to uh, neural variability? Yeah. So the idea is, is I think, is, is, is quite simple. You know, classical theories of, say, vision or perception assume that neural activities represent one particular thing about the world. Grandmothers. Right. Well, grandmothers, or or, but even if you don't have a grandmother cell, you know, even if you are in the primary visual cortex, they represent the orientation of of a line segment somewhere in the, in your visual field. Yeah. A, and sampling is essentially 
you know, a, a rather simple-minded extension of this idea, and it essentially says that no, the, the brain doesn't just represent one thing; it tries to represent many possible things because it doesn't know exactly what's the orientation of that line segment out there in the world, and it doesn't know exactly. I don't know whether it's a whether it's a house with two windows or three windows that that you see on a foggy day, for example. Um, and so it kind of switches between these different things. It it for a while it represents one thing and then it represents another thing and then and then it represents a third thing and then it maybe it comes back and represents uh, the first thing again. So over time it represents kind of different proposals for what might be out there in the world. And it does so such that the frequency with which it visits these different possible interpretations is actually the posterior probabilities that uh, an ideal Bayesian observer would infer for those possible interpretations of the world. So it, it uses this kind of switching between different interpretations to, uh, to represent its uncertainty and to essentially say that I don't know what it is, but... It's probably this thing, and that's why I'm spending most of my time representing this particular interpretation. But it could be this other thing or this 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 third thing, and so I'm also going to spend some time, you know, representing those those other things. So it's representing uncertainty uh, and at the same time gathering evidence for the posterior. Okay, so that's a different question. Whether you are, you know, so uh, evidence gathering or evidence integration is a whole other kind of. Kind of works. That's a different algorithm. That's a different computation. But so. even if even if the input doesn't change, in principle, for the same fixed input, you would want to represent a probability distribution, the Bayesian posterior, over possible interpretations of that one fixed input. And so the idea here is that the brain represents that posterior distribution by kind of walking through these different possible interpretations over time, even while the input is remains the same fixed thing. Ah, I see. So you, um, there's, a, there's a lot more we could actually talk about here, and we don't want to go too deep, but you've developed models to, to test a lot of these ideas, and you've tested them in, in data, like you've said, that uh, wasn't necessarily designed experimentally for your purposes, but you have found these, these data to, uh, to use. So maybe could you just give us an account of the models that you've used uh, and, and the data you've tested them with? Yes. So, so essentially, based on what I just told you, a research program follows from this idea quite naturally, which is the following. Step one, think of an internal model that a particular area of the brain you think might be in the business of performing inference under, hmm. right? So if you are in, say, the primary visual cortex, as we are for most of the time, for most of the work we do, think of a probabilistic internal model that you think the primary visual cortex might be implementing. Okay. Then for any particular, so the, in our case, this would be kind of probabilistic models of natural images, right? Uh, so models that have some so-called latent variables, these are these unobserved quantities, and kind of uh, have probabilistic relationships between how they think those latent variables relate to the observable variables, which are the actual pixels in an image, right? So they assume that there's a particular probabilistic relationship between these things, the pixels in the image, and these latent variables that which could be, for example, the intensities of different line, you know, oriented, differently oriented line segments and things like that. And does the model need to know the all of the different possible latent variables to consider since th th there could be an infinity right yeah there could be but but you can make educated guesses sure. you know, okay. and at least you know first approximate i mean there there's a long history here um yep. uh there's a, a a work that we can build on start starting from things like the you know the famous sparse coding model and and, and things like that and so Think of a probabilistic internal model that you think the, uh, in our case, say the primary visual cortex is in the business of, of implementing, and then provide it with inputs that would be used as, as inputs during an experimental, you know, in an experimental scenario. Uh, then given these inputs, you can compute what the inference, what this probabilistic internal model would be inferring about the, the unobserved quantities, the latent variables given these inputs, right? So for each input, you have a big posterior distribution over these latent variables. And so now uh, you can say that, fine, so 
I can go and look at experimental data because my sampling theory says that the, these posterior distributions over latent variables should be represented in neural activity in a very direct way, uh, such that the wider these posterior distributions are, the bigger their variance, uh, the bigger the variability of neural responses should be. Uh, because there's a, essentially a one-to-one -one correspondence between uncertainty and neural variability under this, under this sampling hypothesis. And so I can go and look at experimental data when indeed these different kinds of inputs have been presented to animals while you know, neurons in their primary visual cortices uh, were recorded. And I can ask, uh, does the kind of modulation of neural variability happen in V1 uh, that I expect based on my sampling based uh, representation of uncertainty? Yeah. And, and the beauty of that is to a large extent, once you decided what this probabilistic internal model is going to be, which to a large degree only depends on the statistics of the inputs that you think that brain area uh, is, is processing, so kind of natural image statistics, for example, to a large degree, the, the probabilistic internal model that you're going to use and the details of that are decided by those things like natural image statistics mm. and not anything about how the brain works per se. And so you can almost make a kind of a parameter free prediction about what should happen in the brain with this idea that, you know, neural variability in the brain is going to represent uncertainty, posterior, you know, posterior uncertainty under these probabilistic internal models. So that's, to me, that, that's an exciting approach that allows you to make really kind of strong predictions about neurally observable phenomena. How wide, widespread do you think that these sorts of computations are in our brains, right? Is this like a very general, because we're talking about visual cortex, and this is sort of the you know, what, what the majority of neuroscience deals with, essentially, and, and a lot of the data, you know, comes out of uh, visual labs and stuff. So, I mean, is this yeah, a, a, pr yeah. a principle that just can be broadly ap applied to lots of different cognitive functions in the same way? Yes. Or, yeah. Yeah. So, I think the, ba the basic principle in, in principle can be applied very generally, but there is uh, specific challenges in, in different domains that are non-trivial with regard to this proposal. So, one one challenge that is actually also quite generic, but it becomes more acute uh, in in some domains than in some others, is is what do you do with with dynamically changing uh, stimuli, uh, but, or when the thing that you're trying to infer is itself dynamically changing? Because now there's a problem because you are already using time to represent a static probability distribution, but now the distribution that you want to represent itself is changing dynamically. Yeah. So you would need to kind of to have two arrows of time here. And so it's not clear how to use the same single time that we have uh, to do both things, hmm. to kind of collect more samples from a distribution while also tracking how the distribution is changing. And, and so that, that, for example, I think is, is quite a big open question. But in, you know, these are, are, I think, quite general computations, and they can be applied all the way to decision making. There is very interesting theoretical proposals from machine learning. So this is yet another instance where we can learn a lot from machine learning potentially about how you can rephrase decision making as essential probabilistic inference and how there is a duality between control, sequential decision making, and or and planning in particular and inference. So you can use probabilistic inference to to solve challenging kind of planning problems as well. Hmm. And if that is the case, so one one thing that 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 we are looking into right now in the lab, and those, we are not even the first to to look at this, but we are probably the first to kind of combine this with a sampling based representation of uncertainty is is how to use uh, this to understand how planning might be uh, happening in the brain. Hmm. Seems like a lot of people at CCN are talking about going to be talking about planning and and inference. So that it's maybe a common sort of theme. I mean, is, is this also related to the the variability in decision making that's been shown to sort of reduce over time and collapse uh, in, you know, just before decision? So there's high variability and then the very via Fano factor variability reduces over time and then there's just a decision made. Does it have any links to that? Yes, it could. It could. I yeah. mean, we haven't, in principle, it could. Uh, we haven't really worked out these theories. Yeah, so it's, yeah. It's, I think it's just early days. It's early, but, yeah. Uh, but, 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 these are, but these are exactly the kind of data that 
uh, that we will be looking at very closely and trying to relate to to our theories. What, what's the what's the current goings on right now in the lab? What, what are you guys working on right now? That's so there's a couple of things that we are working on, but maybe most directly relevant to what we've been just talking about. We now really feel that we are in the position of trying to go down to circuit level mechanisms again in the context of V1 uh, to be kind of conservative, but uh, the and really kind of be serious about circuit mechanisms and 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 ask, okay, so how might actual neural circuits in the primary visual cortex give rise to these representations that kind of give you samples from distributions? Let's see how you feel doing real neuroscience, man. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. 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 I'm actually quite excited about this. Yeah. I bet it, it brings it, together a lot of things that I'm that I'm quite passionately interested in. Uh, you know, like some of the details of how neurons and neural circuits work all the way up to this kind of relatively high-level abstract concepts of you know probabilistic inference. It is. Um, I mean, it's interesting because reading all your material, you know, you really go down the rabbit hole. You really get sucked into it, and then. And then talking to you now, and you kind of come out and you think, oh, my God, it, it is early days. Um, so it's just so much interesting stuff going on. So continued luck uh, with, with your research there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's go with an intermission quote today. The fact that in science we have to be content with an incomplete picture of the physical universe is not due to the nature of the universe itself, but rather to us. That would be Albert Einstein in the preface to Max Planck's book, Where is Science Going? So you sort of um, alluded to, to this. How, how do you think for instance, artificial intelligence is most lacking with respect to incorporating what we know about neuroscience knowledge. And this can be at the computational level as well. Yeah, I don't... Um, I'm I'm usually quite cautious about preaching, you know, about, how, you know, how AI should learn more about neuroscience. It's... Uh, I'm not sure they have to. Um, I think you know they've already you know they've already taken inspiration, and that's great. Whether going forward they must, I'm not convinced. Uh, I think you know it could be interesting, uh, but but I, but I can't I can't say with complete confidence that you know AI is going to come up against a really hard wall unless they really listen to us neuroscientists. I can't I can't make that kind of statement. <laughs> I think you know intellectually I think it's going to be exciting even for them if they keep kind of learning about the brain. Yeah. But whether it's going to be absolutely necessary for what they are trying to achieve, I don't know. Maybe not. Yeah. I guess what. What a lot of AI researchers realize is that even though now we have these amazing expert systems uh, that very often use uh, deep neural networks yeah. uh, to do what they want to do, you know, even these systems kind of lack the flexibility and the versatility of biological systems. And I guess that's kind of a challenge, if you like, at the definitely at the computational and probably also at the algorithmic level. And then at the implementation level, I think there are some interesting questions there, which is... These cutting-edge systems, right now, if you really want to make them competitive with with humans, they just take up a lot of energy. <laughs> if if you actually look yeah. at the, you know, the number of watts uh, that these supercomputers, you know, uh, consume, and and you know, our brain is famous of not consuming all that much energy, right? Especially it's, mine, it's yeah. More than a than a than a light bulb. And so I think uh, if you want to deploy these. Uh, you know, really powerful AI systems in a way, you know, in in, in on autonomous agents um, uh, with with kind of limited energy capacity. Um, then maybe there are there will be some implementational tricks that we can learn from the brain about how to how to do all this amazing computation in an energy efficient way. And that's not something that that uh, that a lot of AI people are thinking about right now. So are you thinking like neuromorphic computing advancing and helping? Yeah, it? yeah, yeah, yeah. But but I'm not I'm not sure that uh, even the neuromorphic. Yeah. So I mean, the, I don't think we know for sure what aspects of 
of the neural hardware are going to be critical. So just trying to mimic things, I don't think we know for sure that we are trying to mimic with you know with the current neuromorphic systems. We are trying to mimic the the really important things. The important things. Because, yeah. You know, why can't why don't we try to mimic the fact that there are vesicles? You know, maybe that's important, and, <laughs> and we, don't, we really don't know yet. Yeah. We'll see. But I just think that that's an exciting bunch of questions there. Yeah. Well, circling back to what we were talking about at the very beginning um, of the show, um, the, the idea of these probability distributions, right? So it's intractable to consider all possibilities. It's an intractable comput computationally for our brains yeah. because we want we have yeah. to conserve energy. And, and yes, I believe as well that energy efficiency will become th – that's a limiting factor that we'll face eventually with AI systems. However, we will be able to use – orders of magnitude more energy than the human brain. So it's not like we're going to be limited to the wattage of a human brain. Maybe. So, Maybe. Well, Maybe. we could. Yeah. It just would might, might take more time or more resources, right? We would have no water left on the planet or something, right? So, so in like a Bayesian, thinking like Bayesian, right, for an AI system to consider all the probability distributions, why would it matter? Uh, why wouldn't they be able to consider a much wider range of possibilities and always make closer approximations, I don't know, to the point of infinitely closer, to the solution, right? So we approximate, our brains approximate, and we eventually have to act. I mean, do you see the, the, the limiting factor being much closer to human brains? Or like, how much of a problem do you think this will be? Like, wh why wouldn't an AI system be able to just make better choices using perfect Bayesian statistics? So intractability comes in in different forms, right? So uh, so exact Bayesian inference is intractable, and not only computational complexity. Uh, so like theoretical definitions of complexity don't necessarily relate directly to to physical resources such as energy. Right. Uh, but you can try to make a relation there. Uh, but also, I mean, you you were kind of alluding to this in the way you asked your question, and I think that's very important. That that even if you have infinite amounts of energy you might have you know you might have limited amounts of time to make a decision in which case you you, uh, you might want to just cut things short and don't wait until you've approximated everything to to infinite precision and so what, what, what those constraints are i think are going to depend uh, on the particular situation and in particular in in future ai systems what will be the l the really limiting constraints uh we don't know but but i guess we know better what to do with with uh, with limited time mm. uh, because that's uh, that's something that that is even in the abstract algorithmic world is is quite directly related to to notions of computational complexity that that people care a lot about in AI. Whereas the the amount of uh, physical energy that you have is probably is probably not so obviously related to uh, notions of complexity that come up in theoretical, in, in theories of computation that most AI uh, people would know and care about. So mm. that's that's why I said that uh, th these these constraints might but uh, might might become more relevant uh, further down the line. But you might be right, and it it might be that we will. You know, we will just develop new energy sources such that we never need to be concerned about, you know, uh, limited energy, for example, for our agents, even if they are kind of mobile and can't be connected to uh, constant energy supply all the time. Hmm. Uh, we don't know. Maybe we will discover cold fusion uh, next year and then, you know, all these problems will be solved. You should go, just go ahead and write the review paper on it and then it will happen, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. What, uh, yeah, what, do, yeah. what do you think about from the other side? How do you, how do you think neuroscience um, what do you think neuroscience could learn or what's most something right now that would be really relevant that neuroscience could learn from AI? I think there's, I mean, I think there, at least I personally, I see much more clearly all the things that, that neuroscience have or has already learned from, hmm. from mm -hmm. AI and all the things that, that it still can learn. I mean, just the, f just the way, so there's the kind of the theory side of things when, when you can learn about how to mathematically formulate problems, how to, how to build kind of mathematical theories about issues of computation and things like that. But also now, you know, AI is just giving us a lot of algorithms that work amazingly. And so they, they are, you know, they should be a huge source of inspiration for neuroscientists, but also they, they just give us very practical algorithms for a lot of, you know, data analysis problems that we, uh, that we need to solve in, in neuroscience. So we can certainly learn those, uh, things. And now in terms of what's, uh, I think 
to me, again, this is my very kind of personal view. Uh, I think there's a lot of interesting stuff going on in, in machine learning where people are really trying to get a better theoretical understanding of why uh, deep networks work, right? That That is very much very much an open question. Why, why can they generalize in such powerful ways when they sh- really ought to be terribly overfitting, for example? Right. Uh, and then, and why do they fail then suddenly so miserably, just as we talked about er- earlier, suddenly in, in some other conditions? So right now, a lot of it, uh, you know, uh, and, you know, people in the field themselves say it, so it's not like I'm, as an outsider, I'm, 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 I'm kind of diminishing their, uh, their great achievements. But, you know, the people in the field themselves will, will admit that, you know, a lot of it right now is somewhat of a black art and it works and it thrives on all the amazing things that, uh, that, that it can do just in practical terms. But, but there is a lot of, I think there is a lot of, dissatisfaction in in the field that we just we just that the theoretical understanding of what's really going on is kind of lagging behind Mm -hmm. and i think there's going to be a lot of interesting things coming up in that domain uh, where people are really going to build a better theoretical understanding of why these systems work and why and when they don't and i think we as neuroscientists will also have a lot to learn from that from that Uh, so we should really keep you know uh, stay tuned well, a hundred years from now, uh, when people are writing reviews and, and <laughs> historical articles about about us these days, what what are they going to write about in this little era of neuroscience and AI? How are they going to view it? Oh, I think they will. So I have a, I guess I have a pretty strong opinion on that. I think they will view it as as the wild west. Oh, still, still, yeah. yeah. I mean, yes, very much. In terms of just in terms of the. Of the social dynamics uh, of neuroscience, even <laughs> yeah. up today, I think it's very much a wild west where everybody is riding around with their favorite theories and you know the things that they think are the most important things, myself included, to work on and and understand. And there is very very little uh, consensus still. Uh, so it's we, it's we are just uh, you know uh, it's just a very mature field in in many ways, and so I think that's how it's going to be seen. It's going to be seen as the dawn of uh, of a proper science, but which is not a proper science yet in in many ways. So the Wild West has good and bad connotations. Do you, do you think it favors the the good connotation or the bad? Because a lot of creativity it's occurs. Both. Yeah. It's both. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of creativity, but there's a lot of um, <laughs> unnecessary blood. Uh, as well and and a lot of mavericks and a lot of mavericks as well yeah Yeah. okay good so you're a uh, young scientist uh, but if you were I don't think I don't know if I if I count as young anymore you may not feel young anyways I'll I'll take it as a compliment yeah yeah (laughs) (laughs) yeah but if you did start over what how what, what would you do different how would you proceed I would probably not stop learning math uh wow really in high school oh (laughs) Yeah. yeah. So I would, yeah, I would make sure that I take a, an undergraduate course where I, you know, where I'm taught much more formal theory than than what I was taught in uh, during my biology undergrad. And is that what you would advise, like a graduate student or something, to do as well? Yeah. Yeah. Do as much quantitative training as early on in your career as possible. It seems like you've done a really good job of exploiting your strengths, right? Of capitalizing on your strengths with this sort of quantitative background even though you just said you would even have even more but but what do you think the right balance is in in your field between exploiting your strengths versus improving on your weaknesses i really don't feel i'm in a position of giving advice to anyone i think it varies widely between individuals Individuals, Uh, i personally have always enjoyed learning new stuff so you know a lot of so even though as i said during my undergrad and even PhD, I, I didn't learn an awful lot of new theory. Then during my postdoc, yeah. I actually made the effort and learned essentially as much as I as I should have learned uh, during uh, you know uh, the the years preceding that. Um, so there, I think there's I guess the lesson uh, and, and something that I you know that I experience uh, up to this day is that there is it's never too late to learn new things and uh, and it's a lot of fun it's just a lot of fun um, you know again going back to those aha moments i don't care even if it's textbook material if for me it's something new then it's great <laughs> 
I don't need to be the first person to to understand something or think about something as long for me this is the first. Yeah, you don't care that you invented mathematical models of the brain. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, yeah. yeah. So just getting back to the conference real quickly, is there anything in particular you want to uh, take, you know, that you have in mind that you'd like to, to be able to take from CCN? Well, yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to a, a lot of the talk. I mean, you know, the program is not up yet. All I can see are the, or at least I couldn't find it, uh, but I can see the invited speakers and I'm really looking forward to, to, to their talks because I know that all of them are amazing people. And so I'm actually really excited about all the things that I'm going to learn from them for sure. And, I'm, and then I'm sure there's going to be kind of contributed talks and, and posters that will be also very exciting, but those I don't know about yet. But the invited speakers, I, I at least know the names of. So. So I can I can make some inferences there. Like uh, even Tim Barons, I mean he's going to be there. You could skip his, right? <laughs> <laughs> Just... Yeah, yeah, maybe not Tim. He's really a boring guy. So maybe okay, fine. <laughs> okay, good. Thank you for that. So, <laughs> what's a uh, what's a special talent that you have that not many people know about? Uh, theater. Uh, attending theater or performing theater. <laughs> uh, well, directing theater in particular. Directing theater. Oh, I, I, I had a I had a theater group uh, which I directed um, during my PhD. Oh gosh, you uh, will have to have you on my other um, improv uh, podcast. So no, I'm just <laughs> kidding. Well, okay. Finally, <laughs> Mate, uh, what's something that you used to believe that you consider naive now? I believed that what makes you uh, the most important thing that makes you a great scientist is is being smart. And I think that's naive, how, how, and 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 that and that that was it to it. That that was the thing. And if you were smart, you could be a great scientist. If you were not super smart, you could not be a great scientist. How has that changed now? I consider that naive now. That there's a lot of other things that you need uh, to be. Well, there's things that you need to be successful in science, which is not necessarily the same thing as being a, a great scientist. Yes. Uh, but, 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 but even to be a great scientist, uh, you need other things than just being smart, perhaps with the exception of, of, you know, of really pure things like mathematics. But in your sense, things are different. So you, need, you just need a lot of skills uh, other than just being smart. Okay, hang on. Let me pull this up real quick. Oh, Holy hell, Mate, my, my posterior looks great, man. Thank you for your time here today. I collected so much <laughs> evidence. It's, it's so much improved. <laughs> Happy to have contributed to your posterior. Yeah, and I'm, and I'm not talking about my anatomy. I'm talking about my probability distribution here. So. Yeah, yeah, that's what I meant too. <laughs> Thanks, Mate. This has been fun. I appreciate it. Cheers. I really enjoyed it. Thanks very much. Brain Inspired is a production of me and you. You can support the show through Patreon for a microscopic two or four dollars per month. Go to braininspired.co and find the red Patreon button there. Your contribution will help sustain and improve the show and prohibit any annoying advertisements like you hear on other shows. To get in touch with me, email paul at braininspired.co. The music you hear is by The New Year. Find them at thenewyear.net. Thanks for your support. See you next time. Man.